another um, Wednesday lunchtime seminar series of our new voices in global security seminar series here at um, the School of Security Studies. My name is Dr. Amanda Chisholm and I am the organizer and chair of this series. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, the series itself is designed to raise the visibility and amplify the expertise of our PhD and um, postdoc and broader ECRs um, across the School of Security Studies. Today, we are so pleased to welcome Dr. Lucrezia Kenzuti. Um, the title of Lucrezia's talk is Collecting, Assembling, Ordering, Borders, Asylum, and the Invisible Labor of Data. Lucrezia is a research associate at the Department of War Studies here at King's College London. She holds a PhD in politics from the University of York. Her past research focuses on migration to and within the Global South, citizenship studies, and illiberalism. Currently, Lucrezia is a postdoc on the project Security Flows that's funded by ERC and led by Professor Claudia Aradau. Uh, Lucrecia today is joined by two discussants, so we're sure to have some great conversation. The first one is Dr. Saskia Stashwich, who is a FWF Senior Research Fellow and Senior Visiting Researcher at CEU, as well as Principal Investigator of the FWF Project Risky Borders, Gender and Race in EU Border Security. Uh, the second discussant is Dr. Martina Tazioli. Martina is a lecturer in politics and technology at Goldsmith University, and her work explores the biopolitical me mechanisms by which some subjects are racialized and governed as migrants, analyzing the intertwining of modes of objectification and subjectivities. More recently, she's investigated uh, the technologization of border regimes and, and how technologies constitute a battlefield for migrants states and non-state actors. Um, so uh, without further ado, and so I can stop talking so we can get on to really what we're here to see, um, Lucrezia has agreed to talk for about 30 minutes for which then we'll move straight into uh, the discussants, uh, comments, questions, and feedback. Again, audience members, if you have any um, questions or comments or um, yeah, and anything um, to ask, please again, uh, feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask it live or pop it in the chat box and I'll ask it to uh, Lucrezia. But uh, yeah, without further ado, Lucrezia, I'm handing the virtual floor over to you. Thank you so much, Amanda, and thank you for, for having me here. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to present a paper titled uh, Collecting, Assembling, Ordering, Borders Asylum and the Invisible Work of Data. And it's a, it's a paper that I'm writing with uh, with Claudia Aradau, and it's it, it's very much a, a work in progress. So you know, feel feel free to um, give comments. Any any comments are, are very much uh, welcome. Um, so before I start uh, talking about the paper, perhaps it, it's useful to to give you an overview of the project security flows on which I'm working on, uh, so that you know where the paper um, sits. So security flows uh, uh, analyzes how datafication, the process of transforming everyday lives into quantifiable data, is also transforming borders and security today. So um, some of you may have followed uh, Anna's uh, presentation um, a couple of uh, a couple of weeks ago. Anna talked about the use of AI at the border and the collection of data at the border. And this paper is is related to that, but looks at a different side of. Uh, um, data collection, uh, because there's been a lot of attention around the extraction of data at the border from, from migrants, uh, but less is known about the, the data that, that migrants themselves have to collect in order to substantiate their asylum claims, so once they are in the country of destination. So here we understand data in, in a very broad sense. A lot of the literature focuses on, on, on digital data, whereas uh, uh, we're expanding this understanding and looking at both digital and, uh, and analog data, for example, in the form of certificates, photographs, uh, reports, and so on. So looking at data from, from this angle allows us to show how datification doesn't, doesn't stop at the border, but, but stretches uh, throughout the asylum process. So it's not just that uh, migrants uh, have to give their fingerprints or biographic details at the border, but for years, uh, people are repeatedly asked to provide data about themselves, their, their bodies, their relationships, their, their beliefs, um, in order to demonstrate that they deserve protection, that they are genuine um, asylum seekers, right? And, and this process uh, um, takes a lot of work. 
And, and it is this, this work that we want to draw attention to in this paper. And, and by the way, we're also uh, developing, developing a, an art project with, uh, with Somerset House uh, on, this, on this particular team, theme. Um, so what we hope to do is, uh, is uh, show that the asylum is not a passive process where people are just waiting. And of course, waiting is important as, as asylum seekers themselves and uh, scholars have pointed out, but it also entails continual invisible work that, that requires uh, resources, including you know, money, effort and, and time. So to build this argument, uh, uh, we draw an interview with immigration lawyers and also archival material from asylum appeal cases from, from Italy and the UK. And it's with uh, two of these cases that I would like to, to start this, this presentation. So these are two asylum appeals that resulted in, in opposite decisions. Um, and the first one refers to uh, a Kurdish asylum seeker who applied uh, for asylum in the UK on the basis of his sexuality. And in his case, and I'm, I'm reading from the appeal, the judge observed that the appellant had done nothing to substantiate his claim except provide a few pictures of him in a gay bar and a small selection of Facebook pages and messages showing sexual pictures and conversations. And here the, the judge is quoted. It is tried to say that someone can attend a gay bar and participate in the exchange of explicit photographs and messages without being gay, but instead to support a false basis for claiming asylum. The second case refers to uh, an asylum seeker who applied um, in Italy on the basis of his political engagement in Pakistan. And his account was judged to be entirely coherent, um, extremely rich in detail, and offering numerous elements of external confirmation that fully corroborate his testimony. This is quite a long quote, so I'm just going to highlight um, the main points because what is interesting to us is that um, this appellant was able to convince the judge of his credibility by collecting many different types of data, both analog and digital. So you have his daughter's identity card and birth certificate, uh, party membership card and letters, photographs, tax returns. And he was also asked to identify and, and successfully identified 11 different locations pertaining to his testimony um, on, on Google Maps. Um, so the very different outcomes of the first and the second, second case show that data can make the difference between a positive decision and, and a rejection in asylum claims. And in fact, although both the EU and UK law states that uh, um, claimant's testimony should be sufficient to grant asylum. And in reality, it can be quite difficult to obtain refugee status without any supporting documentation or evidence. And this is especially true in the UK. And there's a lot of literature that, that has paid attention to this and to what are defined as the cultures of suspicion fostered around the testimonies of asylum seekers. Um, but there has been less attention to the work that asylum seekers themselves uh, need to do in, in, in order to turn their lived experiences into data. Um, so we propose to, to connect uh, two different sides of asylum governance, uh, um, the processing of asylum claims and the question of, of work. And we argue that asylum seekers are, are increasingly performing the invisible work of data by collecting assembling and ordering and making legible um, different forms of digital and analog, and analog data to support their cases. Um, so in, in doing this, we supplement two bodies of literature related to migration and, and asylum. So on the one hand, the, the critical literature on uh, data extraction, which has focused on how migrants and, and refugees are forced to give data in order to access humanitarian resources and to be able to make a claim for protection. And uh, well, Claudia Aradao and, and Martina as well have written extensively on this. And on the other hand, you have the, the literature on asylum and, and labor, uh, which has paid particular attention to the conditions of unemployment, unfree and exploitative labor, uh, precarity and destitution uh, among asylum seekers. So I don't have time to go into, into much detail uh, um, in, in terms of the literature, but um, for example, asylum seekers' experiences of unfree and exploitative work have been um, discussed quite a lot in the literature. Um, as you know, in the, in the UK, asylum seekers uh, um, can't work until they have, uh, while well, they're waiting for a decision, even though there's been discussions on, on changing that. Um, due to well, labor shortages. But even in, in countries where they can work, uh, uh, people's insecure status often pushes them towards the informal job market, 
uh, where they can be subject to exploitation and coercive and abusive treatment. So these practices are enabled by what Nicolas de Genova called deportability, so the possibility of deportation. Um, that creates, according to the Genova, a, a revolving door in the labor market, which generates a cheap and easily replaceable workforce um, for whom exploitative labor is, is often the only available option. Um, then a, a growing body of work has also pointed to the, to the economies that are emerging around borders, migration control, uh, but also asylum and, and refugee protection. Um, so, for example, a lot has been written on immigration detention facilities. Um, in the UK context, uh, Katie Bales and Lucy Mabling have shown that uh, people who are detained in these facilities undertake activities that are actually crucial. Um, to the running of the centers, uh, like cleaning, cooking, gardening, decorating, uh, for as little as uh, uh, one pound for, uh, per hour. And in, uh, in the US, uh, Conlon and, ha and Hemstra um, have shown how uh, immigrants who are detained in these facilities are at the same time captive consumers and coerced laborers, because in addition to participating to more or less voluntary work, they they have been stripped of, of their belongings and they're essentially forced to purchase basic goods and, uh, and services from the same facilities that exploit them. And the situation is also another recurrent theme in this, in this literature. Um, the situation is, has long been a technique for political exclusion, um, a pillar of the hostile environment, but authors have also pointed out that it produces value. Um, by making asylum seekers dependent on state agency and non-governmental organizations for their survival. And I know that uh, you know, Martina and Laura Martin are also doing some, some interesting work linked to this, but looking at uh, um, extraction through destitution uh, and, and the different modes of data, labor, and, and rent extraction in the context of refugee humanitarianism. So these are some examples of, of the literature. There's, the, there's quite a vast body of work uh, but less attention has been paid to the injunctions to work that are inherent within the very process of seeking asylum. So here we're, we're looking at asylum as work, and uh, um, we are drawing on the work of anthropologist Tina Shrestha, who, who carried out ethnographic research with Nepali asylum seekers in the US, uh, and argued that the multiple activities that are involved in putting together documents, uh, but also she focused especially in witness preparation, are similar to work and are also perceived um, by, by people as work. In fact, her, her respondents talked about the work of making paper. Um, so Shrestha conceptualized asylum seeking as both a field of work and uh, an element of participation in precarious labor. So she says that people's participation in precarious labor were, were not directly related to asylum seeking is, however, sustained by the demands of the intangible labor and the indefinite time invested into the process. So similarly to, to stress that we also approach asylum seeking as a field of work, but rather than looking at how um, it embodies and perpetuates ontological and, and socioeconomic precarity, we zoom into the, the work uh, itself uh, and more specifically the, the work of collecting, assembling and ordering different forms of, of data to put together a credible asylum application. So we talk about the invisible work of data in the, in the asylum process. Uh, and we talk about work rather than labor here because we consider labor as, a, as something that produces value to be a little too narrow a definition for what, for what we're describing. And of course, the, the concept of invisible work has, has its roots in, in feminist writings on the unpaid and unrecognized work performed by women in the private sphere. sphere. So this was originally the work of authors like Arlen Kaplan Daniels, Ali Rushwell Hoshield and, and Dorothy Smith, uh, which uh, critiqued this uh, commonplace uh, understanding of work as something that, that we get paid for. Um, so if, uh, if uh, you get paid for something, you're automatically doing work, but if you don't, it doesn't matter how much skills and time and effort you put into it, it's often not considered work. So these writings challenged this idea and uh, it focused uh, in particular on feminized reproductive labor at the beginning, but with time, scholars also expanded the term invisible work to encompass uh, um, a wide range of uh, reproductive and, and non-reproductive, unpaid and underpaid activities uh, performed by, by women, but, but not only. So 
examples of non-feminized activities that are like the labor, the, the work that patients are performing, managing health records. Um, so this, it can, there's an emphasis here on, on effort, time, resources, and also emotions. And SDS and media communication scholars have also adopted this notion of work uh, in, in relation to, to data. So for example, Jerome Denis has talked about the, the invisible work of data uh, to challenge this idea of data as something uh, that can seamlessly flow from one place to another. So our understanding of invisible work is similar to the one adopted by SDS and media and communication scholars. But as I said earlier, um, we are also encompassing an analog traces such as documents, certificates and reports. So we saw all this as data. Um, now to, to go back to the, to the empirical um, side of things, this is uh, an excerpt from um, one of the two cases that I introduced at the beginning, the case of the Pakistani asylum seeker who um, attached a lot of, uh, of data and documentation um, to his, uh, his application. And the literature on migration has shown um, that documents, well, they've talked uh, uh, about documents as concrete distillations of state power. So Horton said that through documents, uh, the state strives to identify and enumerate its population and, and separate it by legal status. But if we if we look at, at this other archive of power, at the, at the archive of asylum appears, um, we'll see that it's not the, the state that strives, it's, it's asylum seekers. And they, they strive to access, collect, assemble, and order different forms of analog and digital data. So just to, to clarify, both in Italy and, and in the UK, well, in the EU, in general, asylum seekers are uh, responsible for providing evidence in support of their application and uh, proving that they're eligible for protection. And if they don't have uh, identity documents, uh, the, the range of information that is required uh, um, can be quite large. Um, uh, so asylum seekers are, are expected to turn as much as possible into, into their lives, uh, uh, into data. And immigration lawyers uh, have compared this to, to the making of a cake because uh, like a cake, you know, collecting evidence, it, it takes uh, um, the careful selection and, and assemblage of, of material. And this, in turn requires resources, effort, and, and time, and, and sometimes skills. And the, the amount of evidence attached to, um, to N's application, the one that we see on the screen, to his appeal kind of gives us an idea of this. Um, and uh, I, I interviewed his lawyer who explained that the process of retrieving all of the documents for, for his case took several months. And actually, the hearing itself took 10 hours, which is uh, um, exceptional. Um, and uh, however, she also, she also pointed out that uh, the, the, the collection of these documents, of all this evidence, uh, was, was made possible by the, the level of education of this person and also and especially the financial means of this person. So she really emphasized that. Uh, and was someone who, uh, well, he was a shop owner. He had two shops in his country. Um, he had uh, money to be able to retrieve certain, certain um, data. And also he, um, he had connections with uh, uh, people from the political party he was active in outside of Pakistan. So this interview excerpt really points to how dimensions also like the country of origin, class and education levels um, affect uh, people's ability to even perform the invisible labor that, that the invisible work that we're talking about um, and how uh, the, the requirements of the asylum process often penalize the most vulnerable groups. And later in the interview, um, the lawyer also pointed out that there are uh, also significant risks in trying to well, retrieve uh, um, some of this material from the country of destination, both for asylum seekers and, and their families if they're helping. Um, and also especially leaving with this kind of information because paradoxically people find themselves in a situation where in order to prove that they are facing persecution, um, they would need to provide some of the same documents that, um, that they had to, that would incriminate them in the country of origin that they had to discard. Like a lot of times we've seen popping up, well, even in this case, in, in Anne's case, um, before the appeal at the Territorial Commission, he was dismissed because he didn't have an arrest warrant. So the, the, the process of assembling and collecting evidence uh, 
uh, involves invisible and at times also, also dangerous work. But it is work that asylum seekers are, are expected to perform. Uh, so we, we've seen in, in many of these cases that uh, um, judges have made comments uh, on uh, the, the lack uh, of evidence or insufficient evidence, uh, or the fact that uh, um, the data provided or the documents provided uh, hadn't been contextualized. So we have a certificate here, where does it come from? So there is, uh, uh, you know, this, this expectations that you should also translate um, what, what you're providing in a way that is, uh, that is uh, uh, intelligible and understandable to decision makers. So this is the part of documentation. And another aspect that we found uh, quite, quite interesting is that in addition to documentation, this invisible work increasingly extends to, to the digital sphere. So especially in the UK, um, digital tools are, are increasingly used by asylum seekers themselves to collect and, and circulate documents and data, and also to, to evidence some of their activities. So uh, in many cases, people rely on, on Facebook uh, or WhatsApp. Like on Facebook, you can show photographs. It's easier to store it and, and not to lose it. Um, but social media evidence and, and digital evidence when presented by asylum seekers is often deemed uh, insufficient or, or not credible. The assumption there being that it is simply erasable. Um, so the, the quote on the screen is from another case where the judge said that the appellant can delete any potentially damaging Facebook account before returning to Iran and can truthfully confirm if interrogated on return that he has no interest in separatist politics. The appellant would present as nothing more than a Kurdish male with no political profile and as such is not at real risk on return. And by the way, the, the grammar mistakes were in the original. <laughs> so digital uh, traces on, on social media are seen as, as erasable. And of course, this is uh, incorrect uh, because while a Facebook account can, can be deleted, it, interactions on social media are transactional. So a deleted account doesn't uh, delete the, the, the traces of actions. And this, this tendency to, to dismiss uh, digital tools when, when used by migrants, we thought it was quite interesting if uh, uh, contrasted to the perceived reliability of digital tools uh, um, when used by, by decision makers to verify aspects of, of the asylum application. So in M's case before, we saw how he was asked to identify 11 different uh, um, locations on, on Google Maps, and this is not um, uncommon. Google Maps is, is used to carry out real-time online searches to, to corroborate like names, locations uh, that are mentioned in asylum seekers' testimony. Uh, and it is seen as a, as a useful tool by, by decision makers. Uh, and some of the um, lawyers uh, I sp we spoke with uh, uh, said that, especially in the past, uh, kind of hearings were similar to tours around the village um, where people were asked to describe routes, uh, name roads, local landmarks, and so on. Um, however, I mean, even for, as this uh, lawyer points out, and some of the areas that are of interest for these hearings are, are not really present in Google Maps uh, or other online tools. Uh, so there are some blank areas or the, there's very outdated uh, um, data information on, on there. And uh, uh, you know, this, this can uh, make using something like Google Maps, which may seem banal, quite, quite difficult. And to add to that, uh, you know, most maps, especially those used in uh, by, by judges, because obviously they're not going to put the one in Arabic there, but they, they are written in the Latin script with only some names in Arabic, um, which also may not be uh, obviously the language of people. Uh, and the, there's another point to make is that some people speak uh, uh, very local languages that are not even present. On, uh, on online tools. I was uh, speaking to a, an asylum seeker last week who um, told me that she was actually struggling because nothing online is in, in her native language. Um, so yeah, this, this adds uh, something that seems uh, easy can become quite, quite complicated. And well, authors like Massimiliano, Massimiliano Spotti, um, especially in relation to, to language, they've done some, some really interesting work on, on language and the importance of naming things right. And uh, um, so Spotty showed that in asylum hearings, uh, the factual knowledge that, uh, that uh, decision makers uh, uh, are often looking for 
um, may not be there because uh, of uh, language issues or because of uh, discrepancies in, in naming practices. So the names that, that you may find online when you, you do some research may not be the same ones that people grew up with. So this, this shows that in addition to, to collecting and assembling data, asylum seekers are also expected to, well, acquire some, some skills and knowledge necessary to to provide certain information or translate that information so that it is uh, accessible uh, um, to, to courts. And this can also take time. And uh, again, the, the second quote on the screen that the lawyer talked about uh, having worked with clients sometimes up to 15 hours uh, um, to collect information, but also using, using Google Maps. And ideally you, you start preparing far in advance. So this is the last section of the paper. So I'm gonna go uh, through it quite quickly, both because I'm, I'm conscious about time and because it's very much a, <clears throat> a work in, in, in progress. Um, but we've also started thinking about you know, the temporalities of, of invisible work and, and the strikingly long uh, periods of time that elapse from like between the lodging of the, the application and, and the decision. There was a, a recent report by the, the Refugee Council, uh, which showed that at the end of March 2021, there were 66,185 people waiting for an, an initial decision, um, three quarters of which had been waiting for over six months, and that the back, backlog of cases in the UK this um, has increased uh, almost tenfold since 2010. And, and this is, of course, is just the initial state, uh, stage, and then you have uh, the, the appeals and asylum seekers have reported waiting times as long as eight, but also up to, to 15 years. And this is reflected in, in some of the cases that we looked at. We, we started really tracing how much time it took and, and sometimes it is, it is quite striking. So the, the Refugee Council um, report describes this, this time as a cruel wait. And uh, you know, asylum seekers themselves have talked about how painful this waiting is. Um, and of course, there have been scholars who have described this process of waiting as a, an existential limbo or, or a liminal space marked by insecurity and immobility. And these are all very important contributions, but um, what we also think is important is to specify that people are not just passively uh, waiting for a decision to be, make, to be made. Uh, so while, while they're waiting, waiting, they gather evidence, they uh, you know, have to go to, to doctor's appointments to document certain, certain uh, aspects of their narrative. They, ha they have their applications rejected, they gather new evidence, recall witnesses, and, and, so, and so on. So the asylum process involves uh, sustained invisible work. And another interesting fact about temporality, actually have probably to develop this, is that they have to collect data about, about their past, but also to continue documenting themselves in, in a way with like sort of place activities like polit political activities uh, um, outside their country of origin so pertaining to the present or in Italy for example in order to get humanitarian or now special protection you should show some level of, of integration and, and therefore like you need to prove activities such as uh, as volunteering or that you're working and, and so on. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, we thought this, this was also quite an interesting aspect. Now I'm running out of time. So just to, to wrap up um, very, very quickly. So our, our main point is uh, um, that asylum seeking entails um, work and this is extensive and, and continual invisible work. And we think that, that attending to, to these forms of invisible work is, is crucial to understanding all the challenges of, of asylum seeking beyond just you know, the, the, the migratory journey, also in the, in the country of, of destination. And it's also important to, to counter some problematic depictions of, of asylum seekers as, as passive subjects who are just waiting for, for a decision to be made and also the um, sometimes racist discourses that get attached to that. Uh, of course, waiting is an important uh, aspect, but uh, it, there's there's more than than that. And you know, when when these activities are performed by um, by lawyers or by judges, they are seen as as work. Um, so we we think it's important to uh, kind of change this this understanding, well, challenge the separation of uh, where work, what work is, and and who performs it. 
And finally, the concept conceptualization of invisible work uh, raises important uh, well, political questions about, about the equipment and, and resources uh, um, that asylum seekers have uh, or actually don't have uh, at, at, the, at their disposal to undertake this work. Um, and this has political implications for, for how we understand the, the resources, responsibilities, and also the, the resistance uh, to the making of precarious subjects. And this is it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hopefully I'm not too out of time. Amanda, shall I? Okay, um, so thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lucrezia, for uh, uh, the presentation. And I also had the pleasure to read the draft of the paper uh, in advance. Um, <clears throat> so, and for me, it's a super interesting in contribution to um, a literature on, on asylum, precisely for this uh, angle on um, work, work and time that, as you say in the paper, uh, remain under theorized uh, in migration literature, or at least I mean, this, this combination of like analysis on time and um, uh, labor. Um, and actually, while you were speaking, I mean, I have, I, I have uh, three points, but uh, while you were speaking, what came to my mind is that um, in most of migration literature, there is a lot of like, um, there are many analyses about um, migrants and asylum seekers being turned into exploitable labor force. Um, so the fact that they are put to work, but there is much less about how this process that you uh, describe uh, steal their time as potential workers. So that basically delay their entrance in the in the potential like labor market uh, in Europe. And and this is something that from a different perspective, feminist scholar Jasbir Puar um, I mean developed in a quite nice way, speaking about engaging with the concept of um, uh, slow debt and saying, okay, very a lot of attention has been paid to the concept of debt, but what about uh, the slow dimension and what happens while people are delayed? Uh, and as you described, they are not just waiting. They are not just in a limbo as many scholars describe, but they are forced to do uh, a lot of activities that are necessary for them to, um, to, to obtain, I mean, to, to get their main uh, goal. Um, so I have three uh, points, um, and of course, feel free also not, not to address all of them. Um, the first uh, point that I would like to raise is about your multiple, so throughout the paper and also in the presentation, you uh, speak about work uh, and also work and labor, even if now you have clarified it, and you prefer the use of like uh, the term work, um, capturing different aspects. So for instance, in the paper, you also refer to cognitive labor, and then there is this expression, the work of data uh, that you um, illustrate in the presentation. And then there is uh, the work uh, um, in, of bringing also this analogical evidence. So I was wondering, uh, well, if you're, what are you, I mean, from a theoretical methodological point of view, uh, what are you trying to do in the paper by bringing together this um, concept of work that uh, remain also, I mean, that usually are also, analyzed in a, uh, in a separate or distinct way in the literature. So for instance, the, uh, what do we gain from um, labeling all these different activities? So cognitive labor uh, and the work of data. Um, uh, it, I understand that there is this like building on anthropology literature on uh, what is labor in terms of activities, but um, there are multiple um, aspects of labor that you described. So I, I was curious um, if uh, you're, I mean, if maybe you're planning to develop also um, a theoretical section about what are you doing uh, by bringing together this heterogeneous um, aspect of labor. Uh, and, and the second point is about the historical dimension, temporal dimension. Um, so I was wondering, you point to the fact that more and more now there is a need of, for, for asylum seekers to prove evidence um, uh, through also technology and using like their uh, social media and so on. Um, so there is definitely this shift. So additional uh, digital data uh, alongside analogical evidence. And I was wondering uh, if you, I mean, where do you situate, right? This increase 
in the paper you mentioned is increasingly I mean, where you could find in this archive that there has been this escalation, but also um, uh, you, you situate in part your paper in the literature about the culture of suspicion of asylum seeker um, and saying, well, there is this, but there is also this other aspect, which is not only about the narrative, but also about bringing the evidence. Um, so I was wondering if in your view there has been, so if you, uh, if you say this uh, in like, as part of a historical transformation over the last decades or so, or if you just want to highlight uh, this dimension that, uh, in your opinion, has been under theorized of like the materiality of like data, also analogical data, with respect to uh, the dimension of the narrative. Um, and for instance, uh, I'm thinking about Roberto Beneduce, who instead focused more on the other aspect uh, of like narrative, but also points to the fact that sometimes even if they bring more material evidence, this is not unfortunately enough. So that evi the evidence, also the, de the evidence of data, analogical data is not, uh, I mean, uh, is not enough for uh, countering uh, the mistrust towards uh, the asylum seekers. And, and the third point is about, is a question about, because you engage more with like STS literature on uh, work and then anthropology literature, um, so I was wondering, uh, because for me, the, the most uh, immediate automatic like uh, um, uh, uh, direction for uh, discussing this is also feminist literature on unpaid labor. And I was wondering, uh, what does the category of work uh, does uh, in your analysis from a political point of view? So uh, while for feminist literature on unpaid labor, the point is to um, highlight also the modes of invisible exploitation that are at stake, and in some cases also to to I mean to situate these in claims for remuneration, even if this is not the only. I mean, this is just one of the steps. So I was wondering, um, even if you don't conflate, I mean, you distinguish. You say for us, work is not only related; is not necessarily related to value production and exploitation. But I was wondering what what is, I mean, let's say, uh, the political stake of visibilizing labor? Should I address these points first or? Um, I think for efficiency, let's have Saskia go and then you can just. <laughs> you, you can note secrets, yeah. Uh, yes, <laughs> such as low note taker, but yes. <laughs> but, but you also choose what you want to respond to too, right? I don't know if we have time to respond to all of them, but yeah, certainly some really great feedback. So yeah, Saskia, on to you. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, and it's going to go very neatly from what Martina has just said. Uh, thank you for the paper and, and the great presentation. When Amanda asked me to join as a discussant, I, I jumped at the opportunity because I'm really intrigued by the idea of bringing the concept of work and or labor to the processes of, of and practices of asylum. Um, and for me, this combines two things that I'm also interested in. And uh, one is a more long-term interest in feminist global political economy and how it contributes to understanding different security regimes and practices. I'm also thinking here about Amanda's work in, uh, on security as labor and specifically her work on the invisible labor that goes into enabling migration for security work, which is a slightly different angle, but I think speaks to many of, of those themes. And um, so I'm just gonna use uh, these few minutes to, to probably highlight a few of the contributions that such an approach uh, feminist global political economy can make to the study on the interrelations between migration and invisible labor. And then particular probably to carve out a little bit more the broader societal structures and relations of power um, in which your specific empirical phenomenon is embedded and then link this um, to, to another interest of mine in EU borders and how gender and race inform our understandings of deservingness and riskiness and so on and so forth. So I'm thinking, you know, feminist uh, global political economy makes two theoretical maneuvers that are interesting. And one is, uh, is that you already mentioned this, um, that they propose a, a much broader uh, definition of work that includes reproductive, emotional, and so on. Um, but they always ask, as well, you know, how is this sort of labor uh, invisibilized in order to sustain 
other kinds of labor uh, and the broader structures of capitalism, market-driven driven logics, and the so-called productive labor. Uh, so this is why I think you might maybe, maybe a neat distinction between labor and work does not work <laughs> in this context. Um, and then feminists, you know, ask us to, to unpack, you know, how do the notions of gender and race inform what counts as labor and what doesn't, and which kind of labor is then uh, as a consequence invisibilized. And you're touching upon that in the paper as well. Um, and I was particularly intrigued when you spoke about, you know, how the, the, the work of lawyers, NGO workers, judges, EU authorities um, is seen as work, but then others not. So this made me think, you know, what kinds of understandings of masculinity, femininity, and also whiteness go into these judgments? And isn't the whole procedure that you're describing sort of an, an exercise in how to approximate an imagination of a white middle-class handling of one's own data. And everyone who cannot live up to these standards is then somehow feminized and racialized. Um, and that's why it's becoming so easy to invisibilize this kind of work. Um, and I think from approaching it from this broader angle um, can help us get out of this individualized understanding of what is going on there. Um, and embed more broadly in the political economy of migration. You spoke about this, you know, the migration industries and so on, but also the, the regular labor markets that um, asylum seekers then can enter or the, also the informal labor markets that they do enter. So I think this might help, you know, talk about the relationship between these precarious migrants on labor markets and the invisible labor that goes into the, the asylum claim itself. So not only draw on these different literatures, but also ask how do these different phenomena interact with each other? Um, also, I mean, there's lots of stuff nowadays about bordering as labor and the laborious process and what kinds of activities are being seen and which not. So I think just by exploring by what kind of work is being seen, you can say a lot about what is invisibilized and why. Um, and to connect more broadly to these issues how, of how our borders um, governed in the modern world. Um, so to answer also sort of the question that Martina had, you know, what does the, the notion of work, what additional layers does this reveal about the whole process? What are we seeing when we're addressing this as work and not waiting or something else? Um, and also what makes the work uh, for asylum different from the work that goes into other kinds of migration? For example, visa applications for labor migration is extremely um, laborious and also depends on a community, depends on family members. So there, there's broader networks that are also gendered um, that, that are probably interested is interesting here. I have more, but I'm just gonna leave it at that and see if there's, <laughs> if you wanna respond and if there's more from the audience. Thank you anyways, it was really inspiring. First of all, um, thank you so much for all this uh, um, great feedback and these uh, and these comments. That they're really they're really useful and and uh, some of them also reflect conversations that that Claudia and I have have been having. And uh, for a starter, this uh, um, distinction between labor and work. I mean, it, it started. I'm going to address them kind of like group some together. Some of the points of Martina and some of the points of Saskia, and then I will uh, probably forget something. But feel free to 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 remind me. Um, so we we started, and in fact, the, the initial title was about labor. But then we we judged that kind of this uh, idea of labor as as value production didn't um, as the production of value didn't quite capture what what we wanted to say. So we took a more you could say like a, an everyday understanding of uh, of work and what uh, what is perceived as as work uh, but we're also afraid we're also aware that then there is the first of all the, the risk of uh, you know stretching that that com the concept too much so what doesn't um count of work and this is uh, why we we borrow from feminist scholars that uh, um, emphasize the role of, of effort uh, time and resources and actually something that well the literature also emphasize uh, emotions and that's something perhaps that, that we should explore a little bit more because uh, a lot goes into into you know assembling and re replacing all of these uh, traces uh, these traces together um so we we very much uh, 
kind of followed Dorothy Smith uh, advocating for a more generous notion of work, but uh, something that um, you know still uh, maintains that traditional understanding of something that uh, 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 requires resources and time, but also that is uh, kind of enmeshed in, in relations uh, uh, organizations and also forms of forms of power. And that it shapes uh, um, the way that people relate to to others uh, in in invisible in invisible ways. And I think, uh, you know, you you are right in in uh, saying well that we talk about the different different forms of uh, forms of work here. And uh, in terms of uh, what we gain from from labeling it, it's it's probably something that 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 we should that we should reflect on. And I also agree that uh, there isn't a, a clear distinction perhaps between that work and, and labor as, as, ask, as Saskia said, because keeping these, uh, these people outside of work, again, as, as Martina highlighted, I mean, it delays uh, uh, the, the entering into this, uh, uh, you know, in, into, into work, but uh, at the same time, um, it, it, it uh, perpetuates, it contributes to that precarity Right, and maybe uh, pushing people towards even more more informal and, and risky jobs. So uh, definitely a, a good point that that uh, we should we should elaborate on. And I think this, uh, in terms of what the political uh, what the political implications um, of this are, um, I think it, it links very well to what uh, to what Saskia said. So Martina's question and and, and Saskia's question are kind of linked in a way that. It's important to draw attention to how the the construction of what counts as work uh, depends on well legal structures, but also on the intersection of factors like uh, race, uh, gender, and 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 other dimensions. So whose whose work doesn't doesn't go recognized? So all of these factors shape how we, we defined work and also whose uh, work is, is invisibilized, right? So I think uh, that drawing attention to that uh, can then draw, draw attention to, to all those, uh, uh, those wider issues that, that, that we've been, we've been uh, uh, talking about that Saskia has, uh, has been highlighting. And I think it is also important to think about uh, um, resources, right? And who has the resources, the fact that uh, lawyers and judges when they do this work it is uh, uh, it is work but asylum seekers are sometimes um, asked to do very similar things but with little to no resources uh, and even you know things like going to hearings in, in a couple of the um, of the appeal cases that we've read I mean people weren't able or like were they uh, they weren't able to show up because they didn't have the money to pay for the fare so it's this uh, you know it's, it's a cycle that reinforces itself and I think thinking about uh, uh, work and the resources that are needed for work is is also an important uh, um, and important political um, implications of this and also again linking to to another point of what of what Saskia said so kind of the link with uh, with uh, with security um, in a way um, thinking about the 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 work like the, the reproduction, I guess, of, uh, of bordering systems and who, who does the work that, that reproduces it also, you know, beyond the, um, just the, the travel and, and the border, but yes. So I think this is uh, another point um, that, uh, um, that, that, we, that we highlight and that is important. But I'm trying to, <laughs> I told you that I'm very slow at writing notes. So now it's almost impossible to understand, um, but the, um, the historical dimension. Um, so the shift. I have to say that um, kind of the 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 increase of uh, of uh, digital data is mostly like used by asylum seekers themselves in in more recent years. So in more recent appeals to to collect and and store um, the 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 documents or photographs or or, or data. And it's uh, um, when. It's mostly in the UK, so I haven't found found quite as much uh, in uh, the Italian archive. But it's also because it's very it's much more difficult to navigate the Italian archive, like the um, uh, British one is uh, the yeah the UK um, uh, one is quite uh, neat and uh, it's up there on the internet. But as Martina probably knows, in Italy things are a little bit bit more difficult. But um, speaking with uh, with um, immigration lawyers as well, they said that they haven't found. Uh, 
um, quite the same use. What they did point out, though, is kind of this uh, um, transition to the digit digital in courts. So, so some asylum seekers, well, the, the, the lawyers I spoke, they say that they would like to see more digital photographs or more digital videos, uh, for example, used in the cases because they would be very useful. But there's also a, an issue with the system and what you can file um, digitally, so some of the systems used by courts don't recognize the certain types of files and therefore they can show them in court, um, but they can't, you know, keep them in the records. And I think that's uh, there's also quite quite an interesting aspect. So uh, these digital traces, first of all, in some cases, they're, they're dismissed, uh, they're seen as something that can be um, deleted in the case of Facebook posts. And uh, also when shown in courts, when you show in courts things like videos uh, or photos, and it, sometimes uh, it doesn't then stay in the file, it's a one-off. Um, in terms of the culture of suspicion, um, you are absolutely right. Uh, a lot has been written about, about the narrative. And uh, uh, well, Bormer and Schumann wrote, wrote uh, recently a very, a very interesting book where they also talked about the increasing importance of documents and documentation and, uh, and proofs. But you're right, because uh, uh, sometimes you have a lot of documents, but if there is an inconsistency in the narrative, uh, then that still takes precedence. Uh, it doesn't matter how much uh, you, you provide. So I think that, that again, <laughs> shows... Uh, uh, how the, the, the system is geared against, uh, against asylum seekers. It all fits with this culture of, uh, of suspicion, but also the, the hostile environment and the wanting to, um, to, to, keep, uh, to keep people, how, right, making it more and more difficult for, for people to be granted, uh, granted asylum. And again, another dimension that, that we should, uh, should emphasise, uh, perhaps the focus only on, uh, um, on data uh, kind of misses out all, all this other dimension. Um, of, of credibility, the credibility of the narrative. Yeah, thank you very much. I don't have I, I probably missed something. Um, sorry. Well, there's lots to um, engage further in. So thank you both Martina and Saskia for those really important um, um, discussion points. Uh, Lucrezia, we just have someone uh, in the chat box, um, Iliara Ferrari. Ferrari? I'm sorry, this is my Anglophone tongue. Um, anyway, she um, said, thank you, Lucrezia, for an interesting presentation. Um, I work with survivors of modern slavery and human trafficking in London. Many of our service users are also asylum seekers. I found it really interesting how you talked about the fact that asylum seekers might be forced to work while they wait for a decision on their claims, often in illegal or irregular ways. When I think of my clients, um, I think the issue poses a huge rest, risk as claimants might end up being re-trafficked or re-exploited again. While in reality, asylum seekers should be safe once they reach the so-called safe country. In fact, they rarely are. Being destitute with no right to work poses, in fact, a big threat where exploitation and modern slavery become possibilities. It is not realistic to expect asylum seekers to wait years, sometimes two to three, for a decision and just live on subsistence paid uh, to them by governments and charities. Um, so I guess that's more of an, a statement, a validation statement um, than anything, an important one though, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. I think that that is uh, uh, very important, you know, also this, uh, this notion of, of safety and how that's uh, almost never uh, uh, an element um, when, uh, when it comes to, you know, asylum seekers uh, in, in the UK, but also outside and the, the whole asylum process itself can be quite re-traumatizing. And uh, as you said, uh, in a, the, the inability to, to work can push people towards, towards these, uh, uh, these situations and uh, the amount of money that they get from the government, I think it's around 36 or 40 pounds um, per week is, is not enough. And also people who are put in certain accommodations, I mean, they're uh, not all, <laughs> I mean, even if you, you get a meal, like a lot of people were talking about how, you know, that they don't get fruit or other things that, that they may, uh, <laughs> some basic needs uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, it's, there's a true risk, um, which I think many NGOs actually are doing some, some great advocacy work um, about. Uh, um, so if you want to follow some of the, the uh, other organizations, I'd be happy to, to give you some, some links if you want to get in touch. Mm -hmm. That's great. I think I have a, I'm going to abuse my position of chair. I have a, a question too, while we have a, a few minutes left. 
Um, so I, I, I personally, in my work, side on the concept of labor. I use labor mm -hmm. over work. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, there's Kathy Weeks wrote a great book on the politics of work and why she used work over labor too. So I guess, you know, this is, uh, this is everyone's own decision. But I just wonder, I haven't read your paper, but I wonder for the audience too, who hasn't read it, um, what, what would you say is the key contribution you want to make um, in this paper? Like, what do you want people to take away? What's the key argument that is, that's probably not a fair question. Um, but in working through this paper, I guess, what, maybe not the key contribution, what, I guess, when you're working through this paper, what are the things that are most striking or most important for you that you want to disseminate to a larger audience? I think some of the, the the main points that that we've discussed so kind of uh, challenging a, a certain uh, image of the of the passive uh, the passive asylum seeker is uh, is quite important um, and also thinking about uh, uh, again as I said earlier how we understand work changes depending on who performs Mm -hmm. uh, work right and how those uh, those uh, categories like like race class uh, gender play a role in that in that definition and uh, I think the the point that that Saskia make made uh, on how uh, you know this, uh, this masculine ma masculinity um, whiteness uh, uh, and uh, and all of these factors kind of shape that that common place uh, understanding of work which leads to dismiss uh, a series of of other um, of other actions that that do have uh, that do have implications and that do take effort and time and have also implications on on people's lives um, right, and I think an important point of this, actually, this uh, came from from some of the interviews because we were we're looking at the the invisible work, and that's uh, uh, you know our, our main um, our main point. But also thinking about who gets to perform to even perform this this work, um, what the expectations are there, and uh, what does this mean for uh, a fair asylum process, 